Okay. We're going to start at chapter 2 of Job. Now, verses 1, 2, and 3, I'm not going to read because they say exactly what chapter 1 said. And so I'm going to start at chapter 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now, and touch his bones and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. So what the, Satan is doing now, what the devil's doing now is, say, is saying to the Lord, Okay, I lost on taking his children, taking all his wealth. He still, he didn't curse you. You won that battle. But now he's saying, but let me take his, his health. Let me take skin for skin. That's what it's talking about. Let me take his health. Let me take his health away and he will curse you. And verse 6 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand. That's one thing we don't ever we don't want to hear, hear God say to Satan. Satan, you got Matt. We pray that Job is the only man he's going to do that to. <laughs> but that's what that's what the Lord said. Satan, he's in your hands. But what happened now in chapter one? What did we learn? Satan has to get permission. He can't just do what he wants. He had to go to God, just like he wanted to have Peter. Jesus told him, Satan wants you tonight. So Satan has to go to God. And we know Jesus is Lord, is God. So Satan has to go to the Lord and ask if he can do anything to us. Remember that. So right here, he's saying, okay, you can have him, but don't take his life. But save his life. In verse 4, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smoked Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, to his head. And he took him a potsherd to scalp himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Now Satan, he has always wanted to copy the Lord in everything. Okay, he's always wanted to, he's always, whatever God does, he wants to do it also. And he does, just like Moses. The rods turn into snakes, just like Moses. But what did Moses' snake do? He ate up the other snakes. So the, so the devil's always wanting to copy the Lord. And even here, even right here, he put sores on him. And where he got that from, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 35, now this is the Lord doing it. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. That's where the devil got how to do that. And everything, I'm telling you, everything the Lord does, Satan wants to do the same thing. But just remember this, it's a counterfeit. It's no good. Is counterfeit money any good? Only those who know, those who know what counterfeit is, they can recognize it. And who are we? We're Christians. We've got the word of God. We should be able to be to where we can recognize what's from the devil and what's from the Lord. Okay, we can. But the counterfeit money, I don't know nothing about money. If someone hands me a counterfeit $10 bill, I I don't know if it's what it, you know, I'm not going to know. But you met, you get someone who knows about money, you can't fool them. Well, that's the way the Christian should be. That's the way we should be. If you study this, then that counterfeit, whatever it is, can't get past you. Y'all hear me? If you know this, if you study this, then that's the way we are. His, the, the devil's counterfeits cannot get past us. The Lord says about the wolves, he said, even the elect, if it was possible, he put in there, if it was possible, can be fooled. But the Lord said, if it was possible. So when he said, if it was possible, what he's saying is, says, what he's saying is, it's not possible. Because my people are going to know me from you. That's what he's saying there. And the only way we can know that is by what we're doing tonight. And plus having your own Bible study and going to church. Those are the things that we need. We need to go to church. We need to have Bible study. And we need to have our own prayer time with the Lord. Study time. And if you have those things, believe me, you will recognize it. You will recognize the counterfeit. And that's all the devil is. It says, he sat down among the ashes. Ashes in the Bible, that was their dump ground. That's where the dogs would feed off a scrap. And the greatest man that the Bible, that the Lord said, the greatest man, that's where he ended up in ashes at a dump ground 
He might have had leprosy. The Bible really doesn't say, but sores and stuff, that's usually a sign of leprosy. This man, who was the greatest, and we're going to learn more about Job, ended up in ashes. But even that, think about this, you guys. Think about this. Even that, even when he had everything, and he was up here because of the Lord, not because he was anything special. The Lord gave him everything he had. Why? Because he loved and followed God. But he was here with the Lord. People respected him. They knew he had wisdom because they knew he was a man of God. But then after all this happened to him, he ended up in ashes, in the dump ground. That's what this is talking about. Job, the man of God, the man of God. Verse 9, then said his wife unto him, listen to me, we're going to get on his wife. A man, a man, and I, I'm married so I know, a man, if he has his wife by his side, a man can take a lot. A man can go through a lot if his wife is by his side. I know because I'm a married man. A man can be very strong. Now, we're going to be strong in the Lord, but when you have that physical person next to you, it even makes you stronger because you have that person next to you, the one that you're supposed to be one with. Now, the one, the one he could count on after he lost all this, the one he should be able to count on and turn to his wife because with Jody and I, if she's down, I bring her up. If I'm down, she brings me up. So you have each other. But now, if right here, we're going to find out. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Doest thou still retain thy integrity? She's saying, curse God. She's saying, curse God and die. His wife, his wife is telling him to curse God and die. If my wife ever left my side, I mean, I've told her myself, I need her. I need her. And I've told her that. I need her. I feel empty when she's not around. Because we're, we're like this now. We're not two and two. We're like this now. And that's the way marriage should be. That's the way God meant it to be. We're like this. And there's many times I can turn to my wife and say, whatever it is, and she'll pray for me. And I'll, I'll call her at work or whatever. Pray for me because I'm whatever. I know I can depend on her. So what I'm trying to point out here, his wife turned against him. Not only did she turn against him, but she told him to die. Is Job going through it? This is the way, listen to me, this is the way the devil uses people. He uses people to bring us down. Right here, the wife, well, we're going to see that she was weak. She got weak. She's a Christian woman, okay? And we're going to show she was a Christian woman, but she fell. She fell because she did. She lost the same thing. She lost the possessions. She lost her kids also. So she went through this, pretty much the same thing also. Now he didn't get her health. He got Job's health. But she went through a hard time also. Okay, remember that. But right here, she's telling him to die. Just die. He didn't curse God like his wife wanted him to. Instead, he humbled himself to the Lord. Again, she wanted him to end his troubles by killing himself. I'm telling you people, the devil works through people. The devil works. He can work through the husband or he can work through the wife. He can work through your children or he can work through strangers, friends. I'm telling you, the devil can use others to get to you. And we got to recognize that. Just like I said the other night, a man, the devil loves it that he has women who are sexy and beautiful. Oh, he, he uses those women to the max with men. Men is just a known fact. Men are emo, uh, physically turned on. Well, us men, when we see that woman and coming our way or starting to flirt with us, we got to look beyond that woman and see that the devil's on the other side of it. We got to recognize that. Us men, we got to do that. The same thing with the women. Y'all's is not uh, physical. Y'all's are emotion. So if a man comes to you and he sweet talks, talks, say you just got in a fight with your husband and you went to the park or you went to the mall and it just so happened this, this guy comes along and he starts telling you things that, that you like. But that's the way it gets to women. Men, it's a physical thing. Women, it's an emotional thing. But you women, same thing. Look what's on the other side of that man. It's the devil. Just like here, the devil uses his wife. The devil uses people today. We, gotta, we have to open our eyes to that. If we don't open our eyes to that, the devil can get to us. Right here, I'm showing you. He used the wife. He used the wife to try to get uh, Job to end his life. 
First, she wanted him to curse God, then end his life. Before you die, curse God. He wanted Job to curse God, and he wanted Job to die. And he used his wife to put it out there. Verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speaketh as one of the foolish women speaketh. He's saying, you're speaking like a foolish woman. Job recognized this. He, knows, he knew where it was coming from. He did recognize it. And Job, this is Job. Just remember this before I read this next. Remember this. Job just lost everything. Everything. And then Job answers her and says, Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So his, his wife, like I said, she wasn't lost. Her faith had been ruined by everything that happened. The Bible says the woman is the weaker vessel. Here, it shows it. But I'm going to tell you, I've seen in many cases where the wife is more spiritual than the man. I've seen that in many cases. Not always is the wife weaker than the man. But overall, the Lord said it, that the woman was the weaker vessel. Because y'all believe things a lot easier than what we do. If a man comes with a different gospel to you and it sounds good, the Lord says, he says, he calls y'all silly women. He calls y'all silly women. Not that y'all silly. <laughs> no, he says silly women. But what he's saying is y'all are gullible and y'all believe it. Where men, you know, it's a little different. It has to be because we're the head. We can't be gullible like that because we're the head of the house. We're the priests of the house. We, we need to know better. But she was no longer his spiritual help. And that's hard on the man when your wife is no longer by your side. That's hard on the man. She was a Christian. She was a Christian. But just like Peter, who was a Christian man, in fact, the Lord said he was a rock. Just like Peter, what did Peter do? Three times. So just like Peter denied Christ three times, not once, but three times, with this woman here, this wife, she fell also. Just like Peter fell then, she fell also. Not everybody is uh, uh, as strong in the Lord as others. Now, there's some of us who are stronger, some of us are not. But when we grow, as we grow, we become stronger. I'm not saying that women are never going to be as strong as men, because they can be, and they, you know, it can happen. And as I've seen it. But right here, apparently, his wife fell. Just like Peter. He denied Christ. Well, she lost everything. Her faith was ruined by everything that happened. And she pretty much did the same thing, denied Christ, denied the Lord, and started telling him to commit suicide. But Job, Job responded like Jesus. When people were telling Jesus stuff, not only just telling him stuff, but spitting on him, he reacted in what? Meekness. Did he fight back? No. Did he curse back? No. He reacted in meekness. That's what Job is doing here. Job didn't scream and holler at his wife or curse her for saying that. He just said, well, he called her a foolish woman, but he wasn't saying it as, you idiot. He wasn't saying it that way. What he was saying is, you don't know what you're talking about. If we were in Job's shoes, could we do that? Could we, after losing everything, everything, now he's lost his wife, he's lost his health, now he's lost his wife, can we respond like Job? Especially when he says right here. That's why I wanted to read it. Especially when he said, Shut up. Should I only praise God when he's good to me? Should I only praise him when he does good things for me? That's what Job is saying. Should that be the only time I should praise him? No. We should praise him even when things are going bad. Even if he takes stuff from us. We should still praise God. That's what Job is saying right here. That's what I'm saying. Job will show us if we're really a born again Christian. Job, this book... It's going to teach us where we're at with the Lord. I keep telling you that because it is. It's going to show you where your heart is. Job's heart was with the Lord. And he sh we're seeing it right here. The Lord has given us this book, the book of Job, to show us, okay, where's your heart? Are you like Job? You might say, well, I can't be like Jesus. That was the Messiah. That was the Christ. Yeah, he was 100% man, but still he was the Christ. Okay, well, let me give you a Job. Job was 100% human. Born of two sinners. And look what he's doing. Now, through all this teaching, at any time, if you're guilty of any of this stuff, remember this. Remember this. If your eyes are, if the Lord opens your eyes to something, that you're guilty of any of these things, remember this. All you have to do is get on your knees and repent. And the Lord will forgive you right then and there. 
That's an amen, right? That's an amen. If you're guilty of any of this, and show, the Lord shows you, and you realize it, all you got to do is fall on your knees, repent, and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for showing me this. All right? That's what we need to do. That's what a Christian will do. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fury of trials, which is t to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. In First Peter right here, it's saying, the Lord is saying, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's funny because things are happening to you. Because where in the Bible did it ever say, okay, once you become my child, nothing's ever bad is going to happen to you. Is that anywhere in the Bible? I haven't read it. So he's saying right here, don't think it's strange when these things happen to you. That's what he's saying right here. When they happen to you, don't think it's strange. Don't be surprised. Oh, I'm a born-again Christian. Why is this happening to me? No, the Lord's saying, hey, don't be surprised if it happens to you. The Lord is saying that. Philippians 1.29 For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but to also suffer for His sake. So we're going to have suffering. We're going to have trials. We're going to, we're going to have suffering. Trials and tribulations are going to come our ways. Tests are going to come our ways. The Lord said it. Now, there's preachers who say, there's preachers out there, they're on TV, they're on the radio, but you got preachers out there who say, if you're sick, you're not right with God. Mm. They say that. I don't know if y'all have heard them. I've heard them. If you're sick, it's because you're not right with God. And if you don't get healed, you're not right with God. I've had a teaching on healing. I've showed you where prophets, where men of God, disciples, men of God, were not healed of their sicknesses. They were not healed. Was it because of their faith? No. They were disciples. They were men of God. So where do these preachers get to where if you're sick, you're not right with God? I don't know where they get that. Because James chapter 5, verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. What's that tell you? The Lord is saying right here, there's going to be sick Christians. And this is what we do for sick Christians. We, we bring them before the church, we lay hands on them, anoint them with oil. That's what the Lord said to do. So why are these preachers saying, if you're sick, you're not walking with God? God said it, the Lord said it right here, that there's going to be sick among the Christians. And when they get sick, bring them to the church. Did they miss this verse or what? How can they say Christians are not supposed to be sick? Look at what Jesus went through. He was about as righteous as you can get. You can't get any more righteous than Jesus. And what, look what he went through. And he walked with God. He was 100% man, Jesus, the man. Jesus, the man, walked with God. With everything that Job lost, did he ever curse God? With everything he lost, did he ever reject God? When it said with his lips, how did it say it? In all this, did not Job sin with his lips? Meaning, did he curse God? Did he reject God? You, right now, just for a moment, Think, the most precious thing in your life, whether it be family, material, whatever, the most precious thing in your life, things, everything, if the Lord was to take it, could you praise Him and worship Him after you've lost it? Just ask yourself that. Don't answer it. Ask yourself that. And I told you the other night, you're really not going to know until it happens. I pray to God that we will be like Job. I pray to God that we will be like Job. Not like his wife, but like Job. He lost everything. Everything. But he never did curse God. Now I'm going to jump up a few chapters just to let you know uh, what kind of man Job was. I'm going to go to chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> Speaking about Job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Though he slay me, this is Job speaking, though he sl speaking about God, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. How, how many of us can say that? Even if God kills me, I'm going to trust in him. This is what Job is saying right here. That's why I jumped up a little bit. I want to know, I want you to see where Job is at. 
He said right here, God, even if you kill me, I'm going to trust in you. And then the rest of the verse says, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Speaking, he's saying, I will be my own defense. I will tell you from my heart, and you already know, that you was always first in my life. That's, that's all that's saying right there. That he always put God first. And he'll go to heaven defending that. That he knew he always put God first. Verse 16, he also shall be my salvation. He's my salvation. And right here, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Job saying, you do not have a hypocrite coming before you. And what Job is saying, everything I did, I did not go to church just to put on a show. I was not a Christian just when I was around Christians. And then like the lost people when I was around lost. That's how I acted. He said, I am not a hypocrite. You were Lord 24-7. I, didn't be, I was not only a Christian on Sunday or Wednesday. I was a Christian all the time. So right here he's saying, you do not have, an, you do not have a hypocrite coming before you. Amen? Amen? That's the way our Christian life should be. We're Christian 24-7. Remember that. Not just Sundays and not just Wednesday nights or when we're around other Christians. And Job is saying that right here. I was not a hypocrite. I lived for you 24-7. Praise God. Praise God. Now, let's go back to verse 11. I just wanted to jump up a little bit just to show you a little bit more about Job. I'm going to read verse 11, 12, and 13. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Eliza, Four, Fair, whatever, uh, Bill, Dad, and so more. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not. So what they're saying, when they seen him afar off, they didn't even recognize Job. That's how bad he looked. Now what did they say about Jesus? After Jesus went through 70 Roman soldiers, the Bible says it, that Jesus went through 70 Roman soldiers and they all hit him in the face with their fists. Soldiers. These are big men. They all hit Jesus in the face with their fists. And it said he didn't even look like a man. Same thing right here. Job didn't even, wasn't even recognizable. His friends could not recognize him. And when they saw that, it says they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights. And none spoke a word unto him. For they saw that his grief was very great. Now in the Bible, it speaks about Seven days, seven nights about mourning. Like Joseph, uh, you had Jacob and he had his 12 sons. Okay, and Joseph, the brothers tried to, well, they didn't try to, they wanted to get rid of him and they did. Okay, well, you, I'm not going to go into that, but Joseph, when his father died, it says in Genesis 50:10, when Joseph's father died, they mourned for his father seven days. So this is what the Jews did when someone died. That's why they're doing this. Also, Saul and his sons. Remember when I taught on Saul and David? It says it also in there. Uh, 1 Samuel thirty-one thirteen. And when Saul and his sons died, they fasted seven days. So it was a Jewish custom to do this. When someone died, they would mourn with them. And right here, they mourned with him seven days and seven nights. Why? Because it was like Job was dead. He had nothing. You hear me? He had nothing. He didn't even have his health. For seven days and nights they fasted and prayed. That's what Job did in chapter 1, verse 20. That's what he did. Plus, he worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. We're going to see that his three friends, they're going to sound very spiritual. When I start reading, they're going to sound like they're spiritual Christian friends of his. But they're not. We're going to see that his three friends were lost. Again, let me just, so y'all can understand this, I'm going to jump up a little bit in chapter 16 of Job, verse 11. And this is why I'm telling you they're lost. This is Job speaking. Job said, God hath delivered me to the ungodly. And he's talking about his three friends here. 
God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. Now, if you read before this, you're going to see he's talking about those three friends. That's why I'm telling you right now, even though they're going to sound very Christian, in chapter 16, it says they were ungodly and it says they were wicked. I wanted y'all to see that. So y'all could understand chapter 3. To get a better understanding of chapter 3, we need to remember these, though. Remember what, what, uh, what God said in chapter 2, verse 3. He said, there was none like him on the earth. Talking about Job. There is none like him on the earth. Job was a great man. Was a very godly man. God said, there is none like him in the earth. We couldn't stand up to Job. We couldn't. Every Christian that was there at that time, and I'm sure they had Christians then, they couldn't stand up to Job. Job was above. Not great, not, uh, you know what I'm saying. He didn't like, Look who I am. I'm not talking about that. Godly. He was a very godly man. So we're going to have to remember that. Also, the last part of that verse, it says, And he holdeth, his, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. Now, I taught you in chapter 1, the Lord said it. Destroy him. God said, I'm destroying him without cause by letting Satan do what he wants. All this stuff that's coming on, on Job is not because of some sin he committed. Destroy him without cause. God is saying he did not commit no sin for me to do this to him. Didn't say he was sinless. He had sin in his life. But what he's saying right here, Job didn't do no sin for this to happen to him. That's what he's saying. And as we learn in chapter 1, God is allowing Satan to do this to show Job and to angels that God did not buy his love and Job is is not going to curse God. So right here he's saying this sin is not because of I mean this this all this that he is going through is not because of any sin he did. Amen. Y'all y'all see that? That's what he's saying right here. God is saying even though I dropped my hedge, remember in chapter 1 to talk about his hedge. Okay, he dropped it. His protection, he dropped it. He told Satan, he's yours. So God dropped his protection, his hedge around, around Job. But Job was still a very spiritual man. Even out of God's protection, he still was a very spiritual man. And he didn't leave God, like I said, to destroy him without cause. Even, Job, even though Job did not deserve it. Now if he would have committed a sin, and later on he'll, we'll see. Because he says, God, if I've committed some sin, show me so I can repent. But God has said, no, you haven't done anything. You know, if all this has happened because I did something wrong and I sinned against God, okay, then I deserved it. But God told him, he said, you didn't do anything wrong. In chapter 1 and in chapter 2, what's all the spiritual side of Job? Now, chapter 3, Job get, kind of gets into the flesh. Not against God. He didn't get in the flesh against God. He got in the flesh like a lot of times we do. And we're going to see that in... in uh, chapter 3 when, when we get there but we're going to see that Job he's a man just like us but remember, remember this it says in verse 1 in chapter 3 he says after this after this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day meaning his birthday Job cursed the day he was born he was born but why, but why did he do that he lost, er he lost everything he lost his servants his, he, he was close to his servants. He was a man of God. He didn't mistreat his servants. They were like family. He lost his servants. Then he lost his wealth. Then he lost his wife. Not physically, but spiritually, he lost his wife. He lost his health. We, we, you, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we couldn't do half. If we lost half this, we'd fall. But that's why we're here tonight. So if this does happen to us, we can be like Job. We can be. Just remember that. Job was just a man. But his love and his faith in the Lord, he was able to go through this. And if he could do it, then we can do it. Remember that. He wished that he wasn't even born. He was down, but he didn't leave the Lord. But he did curse the day he was born. He didn't curse God, but he did curse the day he was born. Like I said, he's getting in the flesh here, but not against God. He's just mad that he was born. He's talking, he, the next verses that we're going to read, 
there's going to be a lot of things here, and it's all got to do with him being mad because he was even born. In verse 2, And Job spake and said, Now this is a, now remember, this is a Christian man, a, a, a strong man in the Lord. But, right here, he's kind of going into, I, I don't know how to really say it, but I, I'll say a spiritual depression. Because I've told you all before, we should not have depression in our life. God gives us rest on everything. But we've got to follow Him. We've got to believe Him and follow Him. And we'll have rest in everything, no matter what we go through. But after you've gone through all this, after you've gone through all of this, you've got to be down. But like I said, but He wasn't down against the Lord. Remember that. He's down, but He's not down against the Lord. So verses 3 through 10, I'm going to read. And I could... I could take each verse and tell you exactly what all those mean. But at the bottom line, these verses, he just, he, he's just saying he wished he had never been born. But I'll read them. Verse 3. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Talking about itself. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. I mean, he's really coming down on himself. Himself, not God. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness siege upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let the night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it, let them curse it that curse the day, who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilights thereof be dark. Let it look for light, but have none, neither let it see the dawning of the day. Because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from my eyes. Now Job's not the first one to wish he hadn't, he hadn't been born. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14, he says, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. That's what Jeremiah said, man of God. Let not the day wherein my mother bared me be blessed. Also, Jonah. Remember our, our study on Jonah? Jonah chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, this is Jonah speaking, take, I beseech thee, take my life from me. For it's better for me to die than to live. Now these are Christian men. Just like Job. So there's times in our lives that it's going to get so hard. We're not going to curse God. We're not going to reject God. But sometimes, and it's, it's biblical. I mean, we got three men right here. I showed you three men who wish they had not lived. Remember, we're not perfect. God is with us. But sometimes, sometimes... It overwhelms us to stuff we go through. Now, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's ever gone through this much in life. I know they've lost family, but to lose everything that Job lost, I haven't ever seen anyone lose all that. What happened is we let the problem take over what we know about the Lord. Do you understand that? Whatever the whatever has happened to us, whatever trial or test or trouble has come upon us, we let that overshadow what we've learned who God is. That's what, that's what happens. And these men here, they forgot who God was. They said, let me die. Or they said, I wish I wasn't even born. But because of whatever problem they went to, that problem overshadowed what they knew. And they knew about God, about the Lord. And Job was hurting so bad, he wanted to die. He wanted to die. He asked God to take him home. But what did Job did not do? He wanted to go home with the Lord. He wanted to die. Did he commit suicide? How many people would commit suicide? I'm serious. If someone lost this much, if someone lost this much, suicide would not be a surprise. But Job, all Job did was say, Lord, I wish I wasn't born. But Job did not commit suicide. He did not come. He wanted to go home. He wanted to die. He, he wished he hadn't been born, but he didn't commit suicide. The curse of a Christian 
is our memory. That's our curse. We forget what God tells us a lot of times. Even here, Job, even though he's saying all this, Job forgot what all the Lord gave him before all this happened. Did the Lord bless Job before all this? Tremendously. Tremendously. Job done forgot all that. One of the curse of a Christian, and it's a curse, is our memory. We forget what God has done for us, and we forget what God said He can do for us. We have to look at this as being just temporary. Remember, we have a life after this one. I've told you over and over. Whatever happens to us here, whatever happens, and it doesn't matter how bad, look how bad it was with Job. No matter how bad it is, we have a life after this one. We're just here in these bodies, in this shell. We're just here temporarily. Just temporarily. Whatever's going on, compare it to where you're going to go. Whatever troubles you're having here, okay, well, I'm having these troubles, but then look ahead. But guess what? God has gone to prepare a place for me in heaven. Amen? We got to look at that. Now, some of us, we do go through some, like if we lose a loved one, family, or whatever. You know, I'm not going to say we're not, we're going to be sad because we're going to miss them. But also, if we remember God's words, if they were born again, we should also have joy in our heart knowing that they're with God now. And they're not hurting and they're not suffering. Even though we're, we're going to hurt because we're going to miss them. But at the same time, we should remember what God said. The born again believer will be in heaven with God. We've got to remember that also. So this is just temporary here. That's, all this is just temporary. And then he continues with his, his, like I said, his depression, his sadness. Verses 11 through 26 talks about more. Like I just read, he talks more about it. I'm not going to go over all those, but it's just more of what he said earlier. How he wished this and how he wished that, okay? But in verse 25, I'm going to read that one. Because 11, verses 11 through 26 say the same thing, but verse 25 I want to point out. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. In 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. What this verse is saying, if we know who we love, if we really love him, we should not have no fear. What do we fear greatly? What do we fear greatly? Even though we're following the Lord, we're following the Lord, but in our lives today, like I said, and this is to yourself, don't answer it. But today, in your life today, what do you fear that might happen to you or to someone? All of us fear something. What I fear is that my daughter is going to die before she gets born again. That's my fear. That's what I fear. That's my greatest fear is my daughter. Because I am a born again Christian and I know there is a hell. It's not, a, it's not a joke. It's not something to make fun of. There is a hell. And I know that God says, unless you're born again, you're not making it to heaven. And my daughter is not born again. Now that is one of my greatest fears. That is one of my greatest fears. That she is not going to get born again before her time comes. I think she will. I think she will. Why? Because God says the prayer of a fervent uh, person, Christian, a village much, means God hears that prayer. And as long as I'm not going to give up on my daughter, I'm going to constantly pray for her salvation. Now that's my greatest fear. Losing your job, is that some of y'all's greatest fear? Some of us is our job. Or some of us is the one we love. Do we fear of losing the one we love? Your health? How many of us are afraid, fear to lose our health? I am. I am. I hope I, I'm going to be like Job, but I'm going to be truthful with you. I, I hope I don't ever get cancer or something. I really do. I, I fear cancer. But if I do get it, just like when I had my open heart surgery, I had no fear. Open heart surgery, I had no fear. The only thing I thought about was my wife and my two daughters. That's the only thing that was in my mind. 
Because I thought if anything happens to me, my daughters, my daughters need me, especially this one. The other one, she has Christian uh, mother and she has a Christian set stepfather. So she's going in the right direction. But my other daughter isn't. And then my wife. I, am, I mean, she'll tell you, I am definitely the spiritual head in this house. I, don't, I do not believe she's going to be like my first wife when we got our divorce. She went straight to the bars and started smoking and drinking. Now, that's not what I'm scared that she's going to start doing. I just want to be here with her to help her lead her spiritually. But all of us got some kind of fear. Some kind of fear we have. Remember what God said in chapter 1, verse 22. In all this, Job sinned not. Again, I'm going back. Out of all this, it says, God said, in all this, all this that Job went through, I used the verse that said, to destroy him without cause. Well, these two mean the same thing. He says it twice, a different way. But both these sayings are saying, Job did not sin for him to get all this on him. That's plainly what it says. So it's not saying that all this that happened to Job is, was because he feared it. Job didn't fear this. Look at Abel. Abel and Cain. Abel was a righteous man. His offering to the Lord was, was, was good to the Lord. Cain's wasn't. But Abel was a righteous man. And what happened to him? His brother killed him. Are y'all listening to me? So if you think by being a, a Christian, being right with the Lord, is going to keep you from things happening, if that's why the reason you came to the Lord, then you're in trouble. There's only one reason to come to the Lord, and that's because you love Him, period. Because fear is not, fear's not going to last. Fear finally fades away. But if you love the Lord, love the Lord, love is forever. If you love the Lord, that's forever. You will not leave it. But if you come to Him because you fear Him, that's not going to last. If you come to Him because you're wanting stuff out of it, your motives are wrong. Now, these are things that you ask yourself. Am I that way? Am I coming to the Lord because of this or this or this? There's only one reason to come to the Lord is that you love Him because He gave His life for you. For you. I can say just for you because the Bible says if there was only one lost sheep... He'd come and do the same thing. So he personalized it there. He said, if you're the only one that was lost, I would come and do exactly the same thing for you. So our fear, fear is, it could be in the flesh. Because there's promises in this Bible, and I'm going to get to them. There's promises. The Lord has given us promises in this Bible. He's given us promises in here. And we need to believe them. And I'm going to get to them in a minute. But we need to believe those promises. If we believe those promises... If we believe this, you can say bye to fear. I'm serious. Job did not go through this because he had fear that he was scared all this might happen to him. Now his friends are going to tell him that. As we get further about his friends, they're going to tell him that. But we're not there yet. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I should have got an amen from every one of y'all. Yes, yes, God is saying, let me say it again. God is saying it. God is saying this to you. If you're a born again believer, listen to me. If you're a born again believer, God is telling you right now, hey, I will never leave you or forsake you. God said that. Not a man. Now, I didn't say that to Jody because I will leave her one day. I'll probably go before her because I'm older than her. But I'm going to leave her one day. Well, hopefully not. Maybe God's going to come and we're both going to go at the same time. Praise God. <laughs> I'm hoping that's going to happen. But we can't tell you that. A man can't tell you or a woman can't tell you, hey, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. But God can say it. Why? Because he can do it. Are y'all hearing me? God can do it. God can say, I will never leave. I don't care if you grow to be 300 years old. I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? That's what I'm saying. If we believe what God says in this Bible, then we should not have no fear. Verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We don't have to fear what man can do to us. Because they cannot touch the spirit and they cannot touch the soul. Only the Lord can touch that. 
Only the Lord can kill spirit and soul. Man can kill the body, but they can't kill the spirit and the soul. So why do we fear them? The one we should fear is the one who can do that. Lost people should fear them because they can lose their body, their soul, and their spirit unless they get born again. Verse 26. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. With everything he has just said in these verses, he's saying, what good have I gotten from following the Lord? Am I still ending up like this? Now, this is what his friends are going to tell him. Like I said, when we get to his friends in chapter 4, these are things they're going to tell him. A lot of things they say to him are going to sound very Christian. In fact, there's people who believe they were, they were Christians. But I just read to you in uh, further um, chapter 16 or something, I just read to you where God, where Job said, you gave me unto wicked men. And he was speaking about his friends. So that's why I know and I can tell you they were lost. You might have some preachers, some teachers say, oh, no, only Christians, Christians can say this. No, religious people can say this. Wolves can say this. But I just showed you the verse that showed that these were lost men. Through all this, remember one thing. I got it right here in capital letters. Job has not turned from the Lord. I thought I knew the book of Job. But like I say, when I start studying, when I start studying, when you study, your eyes are a lot, you can, you can see a lot more spiritually. And that's what we're learning tonight. That's what the Lord is showing us. Spiritually, what Job means, the book of Job means. And remember this, he's speaking to, every, to me and every one of us in here. Are you a Christian? Job was a man, just a man. But look what kind of man he was. Look at what kind of Christian man he was. We can't say, well, well Job was, no, no, Job was a man, just like us. And if he can do it, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, See, back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only came on them. Didn't come in them like today. The Holy Spirit comes in us. Now, one day I'm going to teach on that, the difference between the Holy Spirit coming in you and the Spirit coming upon you, which I kind of taught on that already, kind of. But in the Old Testament, the Spirit only came upon them and gave them power. We, we have the Holy Spirit in us continually. It's, once you get born again, it's there. It doesn't leave. So we got the power of the Holy Spirit to do exactly what Job did. He kept his eyes on the Lord. And you almost can't get no worse than what Job went through. Y'all remember that. Remember that. Right now, we should be going, and I was letting this get to me. Or I, and I was letting that get to me. Compare yourself to Job. Did you go through anything? Did you really go through anything? God is good. God is good. Well, I thought I was going to go further, but I didn't.